Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for attending this month's lecture. For our speaker today, I would like to introduce Dr. Carrie Connor. Good evening, guys. Thank you for joining me today for this AOSER webinar. I hope you can hear me well. Um, today, I'll be talking about common presentations in management of body trauma and interventional radiology. Excuse me for a moment while I close this. Okay. My, uh, my name is Carrie Connor. I am one of the assistant professors and a full-time interventional radiologist at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. We're a level one trauma center, which means we basically take on everything from the little scuffs and scrapes from a bicycle accident to multi-car accidents to uh, disaster situations where we've actually had at least two since I've been here in the last five years. All of the images in this lecture are my own or that of my colleagues that were obtained uh, during trauma call. Disclosures, I have none. The goals and objectives for this uh, one hour lecture will be to review uh, or introduce injury grading scales for the most commonly injured uh, organs in the abdomen, the spleen, liver, and kidney. Uh, I also want to introduce angiographic imaging of these common uh, abnormalities during trauma. Uh, many residents are very used to the cross-sectional images but are not used to the angiographic images that may have variable um, experience throughout residency with angiographic appearances of trauma and may also have variable experiences to trauma given uh, the level of trauma at your institution. I also want you to be able to correlate the angiographic imaging of trauma with the cross-sectional images. The cross-sectional images you're usually very comfortable with. Uh, I, usually on board reviews, I find that most residents who are not necessarily um, oriented toward interventional radiology often do not know exactly what they're like looking at on angiographic images. And so my goal tonight is to just familiarize you with uh, some mini uh, presentations and what these things actually look like uh, when you're on night float and what it looks like when we are actually doing the procedures. So for visceral trauma, there are many different descriptors of what is actually happening. Um, I will actually uh, only talk about uh, body trauma tonight as there are the entire body, we can talk about thoracic trauma, extremities, and neurological trauma, um, but those are beyond the goals of this one hour lecture and would take uh, much more time than one hour, so we will limit ourselves today to uh, the intra-abdominal organs. So blunt force versus penetrating is one way to describe it. Unstable versus stable where the patient, uh, you get called from the uh, trauma surgeon and they say this patient is stable, so I need your help. Uh, generally speaking, if the patient is unstable, um, the patient will go to the OR and uh, may, uh, those protocols may cross back and forth depending on how the patient is doing and what their needs are. The patient may be surgical or non-operative, uh, perhaps they have allergies that do not allow them to have anesthesia or they are too sick, such as too elderly, uh, airway is too compromised to undergo anesthesia in the operating room. Uh, if they're very young or fairly stable enough, they may, uh, surgery may ask you to do the more minimally invasive thing, which is to take the patient to the angiographic uh, area and try to uh, minimally invasively uh, repair the patient's injury. And also, you may get called post-surgically if the patient has already been to the OR and now needs your help because they have not been able to achieve hemostasis surgically. On the right, we have a very young person who could set all of those variables as far as stable, not unstable, surgical versus minimally invasive. We have a patient with um, a splenic injury as well as a uh, complete transection of the left kidney. So these uh, presentations can come at any, any this angiographic, I'm sorry, this uh, coronal uh, CT image could almost fit any of these descriptors. Penetrating injuries are associated with vessel laceration and or transection, and those are the ones that 
a bullet or a projectile object or an impaled object have hit the unlucky, unlucky target just perfectly. So these are the patients that, you know, the family says, uh, we missed the aorta by an inch or, you know, if, if it had just been an inch to the left or right, then this patient would have lived or died. These are the kind of patients that we're talking about with penetrating injuries. Um, these either uh, result in vascular thrombosis where the arteries just shut off or they're actively bleeding. These are the most common presentations. You can also have arteriovenous fistulas, pseudoaneurysms, and these patients will clinically be bleeding intra-abdominally or externally, or the target organ uh, no longer has blood flow. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I will open up the question box. Blunt trauma, which is much more common, uh, is a direct blow, a crushing injury, or a deceleration injury during a uh, a car accident or a motorcycle accident. This can range from anything that's very small that really uh, doesn't cause any bleeding and just to be watched to something that completely uh, uh, insults an, uh, an organ or causes ischemia to an organ. If the arterial bleeding is contained in basically meat of the tissue like the liver, it can result in a pseudoaneurysm which at the time may not bleed but will actually bleed uh, a quad rupture later in a pseudoaneurysm sac. Also, uh, sometimes we'll have bleeding in the meat of the tissue, especially in the liver, where the um, soft tissue has applied enough pressure from the hematoma that the bleeding will resolve on its own. Again, clinically, you have either bleeding or ischemic changes. Our pre-procedure assessment is really about stability. When the trauma surgeon calls you, it's either because the patient is uh, stable or unstable. So generally speaking, the patient's stable enough to be transferred to IR, they will consider it uh, because many of the times we have the less invasive option. It will uh, keep the patient from losing their spleen or losing a kidney or undergoing surgery in a patient that has a surgically hostile abdomen. One consideration at your institution is anesthesia. Uh, whether or not that's immediately available. Anesthe or, I'm sorry, the procedure should never be delayed because anesthesia is not available unless the patient is um, too unstable from an airway perspective and probably should be innovated in the ER and then brought over to uh, the interventional radiology suite. At my institution, anesthesia is not necessarily available um, within an appropriate time frame, so we very rarely use anesthesia. Our nurses are um, very used to uh, being able to monitor and uh, manipulate multiple uh, presser drips and blood products. Sometimes we'll have two nurses uh, so that we can actually manage the patient ourselves without um, needing to delay the case. One thing that I will tell you is that from a physical exam point of view, heart rate is very, very important. Um, a patient that's normotensive with an elevated heart rate is actually something that you should pay attention to. If the patient is tachycardic and normotensive, um, that might be your only indicator that the patient is about to decompensate because you almost have to have a third of your blood volume lost before the blood pressure will actually start um, losing its compensatory, compensatory uh, ability to vasoconstrict. Uh, in the IR suite, you need to be able to administer uh, fluids and blood products, uh, vasopressors as needed. Um, I would say that uh, I usually leave that to the managing trauma team because if you actually increase pressors or start pressors, you can actually make the bleed worse and you need to be, you know, where the surgeons can actually take the patient back to the OR if they decompensate further. Hypothermia actually makes the bleeding worse as well, so we carry bear huggers on all these patients no matter how long the procedure, if we think it's going to be a 30-minute procedure or a three-hour procedure, we uh, try to keep the patients as warm as possible. Ideally, we like the CT first because we're radiologists. We want to know what we're doing before we get into the patient's abdomen. However, many of these patients go to the OR straight away if they're unstable without imaging, which means that if they're not able to get the bleeding under control or can identify it, then the patient may come back to you without any imaging. And that happens uh, more often than we would like. 
uh, because we want the CT first, we, we know where the bleeding is actually located and we can uh, orchestrate our catheter to the area and then we make sure that we decrease our um, uh, timing of procedure and also how much contrast we're using. If you have a negative angiogram, that really just means that at that moment the angiogram was negative. It could be that truly the patient is not bleeding, but it could also be that the patient is um, currently has been able to stop bleeding for some reason, such as vasospasm. Uh, potentially there's a thrombus at the bleeding site, such as hematoma that's put enough pressure on the patient to stop the bleeding. Uh, it could be a venous bleed, which again, we look to go back to the CT. Uh, where we want an arterial and a venous phase, so that if it's a venous bleeding, we know that we don't need to do an angiogram. Or potentially even artifacts could obscure uh, bleeding. And also, uh, you know, if the patient is uh, intubated and they have a lot of uh, air in the, uh, in the intestines, you may not have a lot of, um, you may have to increase your frame rate to be actually able to see any extravasation. So with angiography, you have all sorts of things to look for, and in these situations, oftentimes very, uh, you're trying to do things very quickly, or you're trying to do things uh, to get your patient out of the angiography suite as, as quickly as possible because patients are unstable or are very sick. Uh, so you want to get them out of the lab, but also be able to see exactly what you need to see. So arterial cutoff and vessel regularities. Uh, intimal flaps and lacerations, these things may not actually uh, be things that you need to fix or, or do anything to. They're just things you need to note and let the surgeon know. Uh, thrombosis, a lot of times if, if something is already shut off, it may be a surgical uh, fix that needs to go to the OR. A dissection uh, may not need to have anything done or depending on what it's supplying. If it's a spleen, then they may need to take the spleen out. If it's a kidney, the same thing. What we like to see is stagnant pulling of contrast. From an interventional perspective, that, that's when we kind of see over that. We know exactly that that is extravasation. You see a puddle of contrast and it stays there. We know that's bleeding and we can attack it. But a lot of times you will see diffuse vasoconstriction that, that obscures this because the patients are so spasmed down from a hypovolemic shock that you may not be able to see that stagnant pooling of contrast. The pseudoaneurysms generally don't form right away, but if for some reason the patient comes from an outlying facility or it was unidentified that the patient had trauma, you may see a pseudoaneurysm. Arteriovenous fistulas, depending on where the placement is and how big, it may be something that can be treated somewhat electively or it may need something uh, to be treated right away because of ischemia to a distal target or it's causing right heart failure, so it just depends on where that is and how big. Vessel displacement can lead you to uh, sometimes a target that says this is where a hematoma is. Generally, hematomas are what displace vessels. And then depending on what the, uh, the organ is, you may see areas that are just not supplying their vascular zones, such as the spleen, the liver, and the kidney. So we'll start with examples of vascular trauma, give you some pictures of what these things look like. Vasospasm is, in a very hypovolemic patient, you see this and it's very bizarre, very odd, and it's very different to what you're normally used to seeing on angiograms except in a trauma situation or a, a very septic patient. Uh, as you see here, we have a patient that has a very um, just thin, pencil-like looking arteries. There's lots of right angles. Everything's very sharp and, and linear. We see some spasm here. We don't hardly see any of the muscle uh, uptake of the capillary blush. Um, this is actually not bleeding. This is probably a cervicovaginal branch. This is normal. Um, here we have an area that, well, maybe that's some, um, maybe that's some extravasation, but it's probably from the bowel, so we kind of have to sort that out. So when you have vasospasm, you have lots of abnormal things going on, so it's very important to try to get as much good contrast and get as much good angiography as you can so that you can sort these things out. Because this, as a quote, unquote, negative angiogram doesn't mean that you have not missed bleeding. Truncation and complete dissection, 
what I would say to you is if you can just remember that when you see something like this, just, just think of it as a target or a, an arrow. This is pointing your way to something that's abnormal. So this, this is pointing your way to a kidney that you're not seeing, and this is pointing your way to uh, gastroduodenal uh, uh, enteric vessels that you're not seeing. So these things are just pointing at what's abnormal. Um, it may be something you're not going to be able to treat. Uh, it may be something that needs to be surgically uh, resected, and it may be something that just gets monitored, but this is something that you're not going to generally be able to fix, but it is telling you where the problem is. Extravasation, again, is the thing that, as an interventionalist, we, you know, when we do an angiogram, we um, really like extravasation. It tells us exactly where the bleeding is. It tells us exactly what the artery of interest is, and that we see that stain of contrast that stays. And it, it should stay, whereas uh, a capillary bed, uh, when the contrast goes across the capillary bed, that should go away. So extravasation should stay, and normal feigning of an organ will eventually wash out. During trauma, uh, generally, you may, or you may very often see a patient that has already been to the OR, and when you see this packing, it means that one, they've already had an organ removed on this patient that looks like the spleen could be gone because there's a lot of packing in the left upper quadrant, but also there's all this packing uh, over the right upper quadrant, so that means that not only is there bleeding, but there is bleeding that the surgeon could not fix. So be very careful with these exams because all of this packing can obscure bleeding, and so you want to make sure that you don't have it a suboptimal exam where you say negative for extravasation and really you just missed it or didn't search hard enough. Um, and it's very, uh, it's very easy to not see the bleeding when those packs are, you know, the patient's breathing or uh, intubated can't hold their breath for you and all these things start uh, overlying the areas that you want to see. For example, this uh, exam on the right, you know, that could be truncation of a left renal artery. I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to examine that further to really sort that out. Active extravasation with AV fistula sometimes is very difficult to see until you get into the artery, but the way you know what you're looking at is you have usually a very thin vessel next to a bigger vessel that is parallel to it. That's an AV fistula. And so here we have a patient that it, maybe it's easy for you to see, but it, it could easily be missed, is that you have an area of active extravasation next to the venous part of the fistula that uh, easily could be obscured by one of these packs if you're not looking hard enough. Especially on this image, this is a very selective image, so maybe if you went back to this common hepatic artery run, you may not have been able to see this at all, or maybe have seen something that looked somewhat abnormal, but you didn't know exactly what it was, especially if the packing is overlying it. So we're now we're going to specifically go to the organs of interest, spleen, liver, kidney, and pelvis, and then if we have time, we're going to go to lumbar artery as well. This is the order of the most common, so we're going to start with the spleen, and the spleen can do just about anything it wants to, from a huge defect such as this that really doesn't cause any bleeding at all, no, no active extravasation in this patient's spleen, and they did quite well, but at the same time, uh, you can have a patient with a very small uh, injury, much smaller injury that has active extravasation can be quite unstable. So thankfully have the American Association for uh, Trauma Surgery has given us uh, scales for these visceral organs. And unfortunately for us as radiologists, these are more oriented to what this, what this organ looks like as it's being injured from a surgical perspective. So if you look, we have uh, five grades of injury for uh, spleen, and every definition basically is hematoma, laceration, hematoma, laceration. The only time we actually talk about vessels is when a patient is, the uh, organ is so terribly injured that it's, it's going to be removed anyway in the OR. So we have to correlate these things with what it looks like on CT, and uh, these don't exactly fit with CT descriptions, but you have to keep in mind that this is what the surgeon would, would think if they were looking at the spleen uh, in the operating room. So a grade one is essentially a subcapsular, you know, something very small. 
um, basically your thumbnail size or less of an injury, probably not going to bleed. Grade two is your, uh, you know, almost half halfway about uh, about a thumb's length or a finger's length of injury into the spleen, and that may or may not cause a problem. Uh, stage three is where we start getting to more and more serious injuries where at least 50% of the spleen is injured, or you start involving uh, bigger and bigger vessels, or that the hematoma is growing. So uh, many of the things we'll get called about are, are stage three. Stage four, you're going to have lacerations that start to get into the bigger and bigger vessels where the vessel is injured so much that at least uh, a quarter of the spleen no longer has blood supply and is now ischemic. So three and four are really where we're going to start getting called for angiographic assistance and, and potential embolization. For spleen, it's the most commonly organ, uh, most commonly injured organ in the abdomen. It usually either bleeds or it infarcts. It just depends on how the injury was, uh, ha how the injury happened. Uh, the goal, uh, especially for younger patients or uh, patients that are surgically um, uh, fragile, is to preserve the spleen as much as possible and to avoid the patient having to have the spleen removed either emergently or down the road from a complication. We're going to decrease the blood flow by one of two things. We're going to embolize proximally, or we're going to embolize subselectively. And the reason, or the way we would decide that is essentially, if the patient is very stable, then we're going to try to get as subselective as possible so that we, one, uh, take out the bleed, but two, keep as much uh, preservation of spleen possible so the patient does not go on to have um, a, a massively infarcted spleen or potentially an infection that would lead to an abscess. If the patient is unstable, then they will potentially need a, what we call a proximal coil embolization where you're going to just coil the main splenic artery uh, away from the hilum and, and as, as we say, just get in and get out. You're going to decrease the pressure head to the spleen. When we do this, we either usually use coils or plugs to deliver them to the middle segment of the splenic artery, which is very important um, to uh, avoid infection down the road because this allows for reconstitution of the the, the gastric arteries that supply a splenic um, uh, arterial supply through the stomach, either the gas, short gastrics or the gastroepiploic. And if you get too far into the splenic hilum, that is where these kind of connect. So if you get too far into the hilum, then you're going to potentially take out both the splenic artery and these short gastrics and gastroepiploic uh, reconstitution uh, vessels. Or if you can get uh, subselective, then it allows those to still uh, give you some uh, flow to the spleen, and then um, if you do a main splenic artery embolization, there's still patent. Ideally, you want to do this just distal to any pancreatic vessel. I'm going to show you a picture here in a second of what that means. What we're doing with the main splenic embo is we're just decreasing the pressure head to allow that distal supply to just give enough, enough arterial supply that the patient can still have a patent spleen, still a, a, a enough functioning spleen, even though it may decrease it in size. But um, the patient, th those short gastrics and those gastroflow arteries have already gone through a capillary bed, so they're very uh, much less, a much lower pressure vessel so that you don't have to worry about so much about that artery continuing to bleed. So proximal embo has a success rate of about 84%. And what that means is 84% of the time, that usually works, but 16% of the time, those uh, reconstitutive arteries have continued to let that um, injury bleed, and the patient will have to go to the OR. Again, the major complications are abscess formation um, because of the large infarct and non-target embolization. But in the hands of an experienced operator, you're not going. You're not going to have a lot of non-target embolization. You're going to be distal enough to the splenic artery that that's generally not a problem. Here's a picture of a patient that, although this this image was taken for another reason, the patient had upper GI bleeding with endoscopic clips placed. I think the anatomy here is pertinent. That the middle splenic, the middle segment of the splenic artery, 
uh, is where you would want to coil if this patient was bleeding into the uh, spleen such that they're unstable and you needed to really get just the pressure head off of this blank bleed. You would want to go past this artery here and make sure that this is preserved because this is all pancreas here and you don't want to entice pancreatitis in a trauma patient. Here's a couple of images of a patient that we see the hematoma of the grading scale, and then we see the laceration, and this is probably a grade three uh, or grade four laceration, but what this doesn't say anything about on the grading scale is that we have active extravasation. So that would be a CT uh, reported call, and you see the extravasation here. Although the kidney, I'm sorry, this bleed actually looks pretty good, this uh, extravasation really doesn't seem to have a whole lot uh, correlating with the grade of the laceration in the hematoma. It's just so much maybe aware the laceration was. Here's another picture of a patient. You have hematoma and laceration. Typical patient, you have a little bit of artifact, and so you really can't tell in this small spleen how big is this laceration, so you do the best you can on your grading scale, but you can tell with the angiograms there's a large laceration here. But again, this is very similar to the previous patient as far as laceration size, but this patient has no extravasation. Here's, some, here's an example of a patient that does have active extravasation. This is the pooling of contrast that we want to see that makes us feel really positive that we've identified the source of bleeding. We've gotten as subselective as possible. This is a stable patient, so we are able to take some time to get as far into this area as possible. You see how little the area of spleen that's going to be um, targeted to be removed. And then our post-operative, post-procedural uh, angiogram see that a whole lot of the spleen remains intact. It's a very similar patient. So we have a patient that we get the initial splenic angiogram. Is the patient stable enough to undergo subselective angiography versus maybe we should just get in and get out? And we should put a coil or a plug right here. We see our pancreatic arteries here. And this is where we feel very comfortable in that mid-splenic segment. We don't want to get too high alert because somewhere in here there are some short gastrics and the gastric epiploic is coming back in. So you don't want to get in this area where you take out that collateral uh, flow. So in this patient, the patient was stable enough to undergo subselective uh, access and we have a very nice subselective access here where we're able to coil this nicely and look how much of the patient's spleen is intact. So this is going to do your surgeon uh, colleagues a, a big favor here. This patient's going to be able to keep their spleen and essentially um, be able to avoid the operating room. Here's a, an example of probably a grade one splenic laceration where it's less than a, a centimeter. And here is the correlation to it. It's basically less than your, smaller than your thumbnail. That's a grade one. And here's one where we don't have any CT imaging because the patient was too unstable. And so at this point, um, I'm able to show you the uh, extravasation. It's just a good ex example of early pulling and arterial phase. So in this patient, and another example of splenic trauma is a pseudoaneurysm that has formed along the uh, proximal to mid splenic artery. And on these patients, what we don't want to do is just pack this. We want to actually get the proximal and distal because if, if this patient has recollateralization from a short gastric or a gastric epiploic, you could actually continue to have retrograde filling of the splenic pseudoaneurysm. So these patients get coiling across the entire artery where this pseudoaneurysm exists and, and you're essentially taking out that whole thing. This patient hopefully will have um, some collateral flow from those other gastric vessels to keep the patient from having a complete splenic input. Here is an example of post splenectomy pseudoaneurysm. So even after the patient has trauma, you still have enough injury to the uh, splenic artery that the splenic artery has to be embolized in total uh, to avoid that splenic pseudoaneurysm rupturing after the patient's actually had surgery. Um, the surgeons are never going to be eager to go back into an abdomen that's recently been opened unless they can avoid it. So we're going to move on to liver. The hepatic artery uh, conveniently is the most commonly injured because the hepatic vein is the most devastating and there's not much we can do to offer to the trauma surgeons when they're hepatic vein injury, that's a surgical injury. 
And the reason these are so devastating is that the vein wall cannot vasoconstrict like the artery can, and these patients uh, will bleed uh, to death very quickly. Again, we have the American Association for Trauma, Surgery of Trauma grading scale. It's very similar every time. Hematoma, laceration, hematoma, laceration, until you get to the very, very severe where the, the organ is so broken that the, surgically the surgeons can actually see what vessel injury has occurred. So grade one is going to be about the same. It's going to be your thumbnail uh, uh, with the damage to the surface or subcapsular tear. The hematoma in a grade two is going to be less than half. Uh, hematoma, you're going to have several different things, but essentially it's still um, more than 50% of the surface area or it's getting bigger or you have one that's greater than 10 centimeters, so about the length of your hand uh, or greater than 3 centimeters parenchymal depth tear. Grade four, you're going to have, essentially we start counting segmental injury where you have parenchymal disruption of almost three quarters of the liver, or within a single lobe, you've got one or two segments that are disrupted. In grade five, almost the whole thing is disrupted, or you have three, uh, you know, more than 75 percent of the of, of a single lobe, or you have the venous injuries that we can't control uh, in the angiography suite. Okay, so grades one through six. Grades 1 and 2 are the most common, thankfully so. Uh, these patients can often be uh, medically managed. Grades 3 through 5 are the severe ones that we usually get called on. And grade 6 are usually patients that the pedicle of the liver has been damaged such that um, they pass away. And the operative and non-operative management, patients either going to go straight to us in angiography, they're going to be packed in the OR, they're going to be resected in the OR. And the surgeons really don't like either one of those unless they can avoid it because if the patient's packed, that means they have to go back to the OR at some point, and that means they're still bleeding to some degree. And if they're resected in an urgent situation, oftentimes the resections are non-anatomic. So this can be very um, bloody surgeries where a patient that's already in hypovolemic shock can lose more blood trying to resect the, the part of the liver that's no longer functioning. So we have the parenchymal and subcapsular hematomas. We have very similar to kidney and liver and spleen. We have AV fistulas, we have pseudoaneurysms, uh, blood clot. But specific to the liver will be hemobilia, and those patients can uh, present with upper GI bleed where they're throwing up because of the blood is going into their stomach from their bile ducts. They can bleeding into the peritoneal. If the liver capsule is damaged, they can bleed into the abdomen. And we need to be aware of our hepatic variants because we can have a limited search where if a patient has replaced or partially replaced hepatic artery that these patients can actually uh, have angiograms that are incomplete. So we want to coil both proximally and distal just like we do with most uh, pseudoaneurysm type injuries, which a, an extravasation is essentially a pseudoaneurysm that has ruptured. Uh, packing the sac is not advised because when you go straight into the sac, uh, unless you can avoid it, uh, packing the sac actually causes there to be an increased pressure and it causes it to rupture. So unless you cannot get distal to the injured um, vessel where the pseudoaneurysm is, then um, you know we really need to decrease that pressure and make sure that we do it very quickly. Gel foam is your best friend in these situations. You can really uh, throw a lot of gel foam, which is a gelatin sponge that um, uh, is in uh, saline, and we've basically it basically helps the body uh, make a blood clot. If you haven't seen it, we use it a lot for liver biopsies to uh, to basically gel foam the tract. Um, gel foam is, can be made up very quickly and can treat a large area of the liver. Technical success for these images uh, can be up to 100% in an experienced operator, especially if you know where you're looking and what you're seeing. And as long as the portal vein is patent, uh, generally these patients can tolerate quite a bit of embolization, um, but it just uh, it, we like to be as selective as possible so that they uh, just have as much uh, functioning liver, especially since they're usually hy so hypovolemic. So here's a good picture of a very small hepatic injury that's not in the capsule, but we still see active extravasation. 
on the right. So even uh, though this would be a lower grade uh, injury scale, we still have a patient with active extravasation. So again, the CT images oftentimes don't correlate with the grading scale surgically because the, the surgeons are looking at hematoma because that's the only way they can see the bleeding unless they actually see active extravasation in the form of a capsular tear. Here's a picture of a patient with multiple vessel injury. And you can see that the arteries are starting to get a little bit tapered, a little bit linear where there's some vasospasm. In the post picture, you see that too, that there's a, a somewhat bizarre look to the arteries where they're very straight and thin. So this patient is very spasm, probably very hypovolemic. And you can tell because of all of this uh, surgical packing that the radiopaque sponges, I mean, this patient has already failed operative management. So there's a large bleed happening here. So they really need you to be very aggressive and, and help them as much as possible because they have already failed operative management. Here's a very interesting uh, extravasation that happened to a patient of mine recently where the, uh, based on the CT, which I don't have the CT image for you, but based on the CT, there was a hot eight low bleed and the proper hepatic injection did not show anything at the time. And the left hepatic did not, but here on the right, we actually see a small branch coming from the right uh, hepatic artery injection. It's almost a complete U-turn with a stain and active pooling of contrast. So this is compatible with a caudate lobe uh, extravasation. It's very rare to see. I think this is the first one I've seen in five years. And I was unable to get into this artery unsuccessfully to manage this as minimally invasive as possible. So I had to take out essentially the entire segment four to stop that bleed, and uh, the patient did very well post-operatively or post-procedurally. And in true disclosure, this is a, so that you know this is a trauma patient. We have patient tooth here. Here's another example of a liver injury where we have a small extravasation, and I think this is a good example of how one could say, well, how do you know this isn't a bleed and you have this as a bleed? Well, this one only stayed around. The other one finally washed out. So this is the only thing that kind of stuck around. So that's your pooling with active staining. So that's our, our bleed. And so we had to essentially go across the entire artery to take that because we were not able to get into this small artery to embolize across this. So we took out this whole thing. Uh, so this patient actually did uh, have arterially quite a bit of the right lobe embolized. But the patient, again, did very well. This patient's portal vein was widely patent, so he did well. Complications of liver. So re-bleeding. Essentially, the largest complication is if you just didn't fix what was bleeding, you didn't see it, you didn't identify it, or perhaps the patient had had enough uh, hematoma buildup that the thing that was bleeding had just uh, been tamponaded off at the time. And so uh, a patient coming back uh, to the anti-suite after several hours uh, is complication. Hepatic infarct is, is reported as long as necrosis, but actually very rare. It just depends on how subselective you are. Our catheters are getting so much better at being subselective and, and much smaller, such that we don't have to take out large portions of the uh, lobar arteries, especially if the patient's portal vein, again, is patent. It's unlikely that you're going to have clinically significant hepatic infarct. Uh, biliary and gallbladder necrosis is possible. It's unlikely unless you have a huge arterial embolization. The reason for this is because the biliary tract is uh, supplied by the hepatic arteries and not the portal veins. So if you do take out a huge uh, chunk of the hepatic, let's say you have to do a proper hepatic embolization, then you may have a patient that very well will have um, biliary lakes and, and uh, basically biliary uh, obstruction down the road, but that's, that's exceedingly rare um, depending on the injury. And again, a liver necrosis and failure are possible, but the advent of a patent portal vein is unlikely. So now moving on to renal trauma, which is in our list here, the third most common, which is only about 7% of penetrating injuries and about 4 to 5% of blunt injuries. So really, uh, it's, of all the things we get called in for, it's, it's um, by far um, the least common compared to kid, I'm sorry, uh, liver and spleen. And most of these can actually be managed without any surgical or angiographic intervention. 
uh, for surgery, essentially if the kidney is so uh, shattered and battered, it's just going to have to be taken out. Those patients go straight to the OR. And medically, it makes sense because many of these patients are so hypotensive and so unstable, they would not be able to uh, go to interventional radiology anyway. Again, we have a renal injury scale, and we have five grades for the kidney. Again, it's contusion and hematoma, hematoma and laceration. You only get to vascular on these when you get to grades four and five. And we have four and five vascular injuries because I think this is a smaller organ and the surgeons can see the main vessels uh, more easily than they can with the liver and the spleen. Um, for grade one, you essentially have uh, either some small subcapsular thing or hematuria where there's no visible injury. Grade two, you have uh, something small again, like your thumbnail, but there's no urinary extravasation, no, urina no urinoma. And then grade three, you do have something that's a bit bigger, but there's still no urinary leak. And then grade four is where you really start getting into the main collecting system. You start to have urinomas and bigger bleeds. Grade five is essentially the shattered kidney or the avulsed kidney, which goes to the OR for uh, nephrectomy. So grade four and five uh, need angio if possible, if they're stable enough, uh, because uh, if the, it, it, you know even if it's a young patient or an older patient, you it would be nice to be able to preserve um, their renal uh, function, especially in someone who has multi-organ trauma. They're going to need as much um, renal function as possible, and to avoid surgery if possible. A main renal artery occlusion is controversial because of the, uh, you know, if you if you infarct the entire organ, it's probably going to have an abscess, and then if it has an abscess, it's going to have to be removed anyway. So the point of that is whether you just remove it at the time of the uh, initial injury, or you're going to remove it down the road when they're still sick. If your rotus fascia is intact, um, this is uh, basically the thing that keeps people from um, bleeding out is if the rotus fascia is intact. If it's not, they can uh, bleed very quickly. If it's intact, uh, they can uh, just have medical management. Again, subselective embo. I mean, we want to always be as subselective as possible. Covered stents for more proximal injuries. This is not as common. Usually we do coil embolization or gel foam, just like we would with the liver or the spleen. And clinical success rate here is a lot lower just because the kidney um, is smaller. It can have, uh, it, when it's injured, it just can have a lot more se severe injury. And if your otis fascia is uh, injured, then there's really nothing to kind of tamponade the injury. Here is our initial picture. This patient had essentially a complete transaction of the upper part of the kidney where even on angiography, though, there's no extravasation. So this patient actually did well without needing to have a nephrectomy, even though the, the spleen, I'm sorry, the kidney is essentially completely transected. And then you also see in the lower pole, you see several smaller grade one injuries. And you also see in the CT, you see a fairly large injury to the, to the spleen, and this patient did well without uh, having a splenectomy or a nephrectomy. Here's another patient where you have a shattered spleen. Uh, in CT, you actually have just pieces of, of uh, a kidney everywhere. I mean, I mean kidney. Um, and then you have very little uh, perfused kidney. And here we have a main uh, renal artery injury where we have, per, uh, I'm sorry, staining of contrast outside the main renal artery. So this patient is going to have to have something done very quickly. Either they're going to go to the OR or if they're stable enough, in this patient's case, they were able to coil embolize without having to have um, the patient go to the OR. And then you see that this amount of the kidney is still going to be patent. And this image, the reason you don't see very much capillary fill is because this patient got gel foamed. But hopefully, this patient will actually have enough kidney function that they don't have to have a nephrectomy down the road. Here's another renal injury that shows you just how large a pseudoaneurysm or an AV fistula can become. Here's a patient that also had a very large injury where, again, the kidney is essentially transected completely. And this patient actually did well, too, uh, for about two days, and then ultimately rebled and had to have a nephrectomy. Here's a patient with a huge, about six by four centimeter uh, AV fistula. And again, you see the artery and the vein about the same time, huge pseudoaneurysm and fistula. Uh, 
and we were able to selectively access the artery that was feeding this entire thing, shut it down completely, and look how much of the kidney is still perfused. So even though we have a large injury, we have a huge amount of kidney that is still perfused and the patient's going to do well without needing to have a nephrectomy. Here's another renal injury where we have uh, essentially an inferior phrenic and adrenal. We were asked to have an adrenal, the patient had an adrenal bleed, and we actually found an area of the kidney that was bleeding with one of the cortical branches. So this was coil embolized with one small coil and was able to be embolized appropriately. And we saw nothing bleeding from the adrenal gland. Complications of renal embolization are mostly related to infection because this is an end organ. A uh, patient can get septic, have a urinary fistula, and renal infarct. Um, generally speaking, those last three are much less common. It really has to do with infection and whether or not the patient has to have an abscess drained or actually have uh, a delayed nephrectomy. Moving into pelvic trauma, the mortality rates for pelvic trauma is variable because many of these patients will have arterial bleeding that, depending on the source, it could be arterial, it could be cancellous bone, it could be venous, so it really just depends on where and how big the injury is. There are many different arteries uh, in the uh, gluteal and pudendal uh, vessels and many different sites, so you really have to get a good uh, diagnostic angiography to determine the site of injury. And uh, an autopsy study showed that very few patients actually have main iliac vessel injury, so it's almost the very small arteries that are very uh, much more difficult to get to. Uh, unless you have an unstable patient, you would probably uh, not embolize the main iliac. One thing to note about pelvic trauma, though, is that these arterial bleeds can have many collateral pathways. And so if you miss uh, the bleed in one artery, you can actually allow it to have retrograde flow somewhere else. So there are many different collateral pathways that can still supply through aneurysm or still supply a bleed. So you have to be very careful to repeat your diagnostic imaging after a pelvic trauma has been embolized. And one anatomy that's important to note is the variant obturator artery, which originates from the external iliac or the inferior epigastric. And this is uh, important for not only trauma, but orthopedic surgery sometimes when they come at the acetabulum, these the patients can really have uh, significant bleeding um, from a pubic or um, uh, a pelvic uh, fracture because this can just bleed very quickly and surgery is, surgically is very difficult to control. So it's very important angiographically to identify this and be able to control this uh, without the patient going to the OR. Again, we have the same things. We have contrast extravasation, trans, uh, transection, vasoconstriction, AV fistula through aneurysm. Um, very important vasoconstriction to really try to nail down the area of bleed based on um, the based on the area because uh, many times you can see that uh, if it's something that you didn't identify immediately. Um, you would not be able to see it without an additional angiogram. And then stent placement for larger vessels, that's usually an iliac or an aorioiliac injury. A lot of times these uh, patients will go to the OR with a vascular surgeon. So again, with pelvic trauma, you're going to see radiopaque surgical sponges. Just try to keep your eye on what can be bleeding. We have active extravasation here with a huge hematoma. So these uh, sponges have still kept the, this patient I'm sorry, have not been able to keep this patient from bleeding. Here's another patient with a huge pelvic bleed. We have a huge uh, stain here with lots of packing. The packing did not work. So this image didn't cro come across well, but this patient got coils and plugs, and we finally got it stopped. This patient actually expired about eight hours later because of the size of the uh, bleed. Back to our same patient that we started talking about, vasospasm, this patient um, we had repeat imaging where we actually got into the internal iliac and you see that there's actually two areas of extravasation here. So this is the better imaging that shows us that there's something we need to actually come in and attack, uh, try to get selective if possible, if the patient's stable enough to tolerate it, gel foam, or try to get more proximal control with coils uh, or plugs. So more examples of extra active extravasation on pelvic trauma, you see that um, pooling of contrast that sticks around. So everything else here is going to wash away this thing sticking around so we know that that's an active bleed. 
Here's a very similar bleed that we were able to control with gel foam embolization only. Um, the patient was very stable, but we were unable to get all the way down to these arteries, so we didn't want to sacrifice essentially the uh, internal iliac, so we went ahead and just gel them. The patient was able to um, clot the bleed with gel foam only. Here's another, another large uh, pelvic bleed that uh, this patient also expired less than 24 hours later where the patient had this huge, this is one of the largest pelvic bleeds I've ever seen, and we were able to get um, another um, amplifier plug, I'm sorry, an MVP plug and a couple of coils and shut this down, but at this point the patient uh, is still expired within 24 hours. Complications of pelvic trauma. Um, bladder. Neurologic and sexual dysfunction, gluteal necrosis, it's actually very rare. Uh, if, you ex if you include both internal iliacs and a very severe trauma, these things are more likely. But really, um, realistically speaking, it's very unlikely to have significant complications from a, sub a fairly selective embolization. Angiographic select, the success of pelvic endo, if you actually see the bleed, is up to 100%. Lumbar artery embolization, the important thing here, is, this is essentially just another pelvic bleed, but the important thing here is to know that you could have an infarct of the spinal cord. This is a very specific complication for these embolizations. And make sure that the catheterization is distal to the origin of the artery of, of Demskowitz. But however, even after you identify it, the really striking thing is, is that after you start embolizing distally, you've changed the hemodynamics and you need to recheck with intermittent angio to make sure that you're not getting reflux. So even though you've identified it and sort of checked it off that you're past it, you can still have reflux into it. So be very careful with that and you know, know that there are multiple um, levels of where the artery extends to at the level of one or two of the lumbar arteries or at the thoracic or from the um, intercostal bronchial trunk. And so bronchial artery embolization could be performed too, but just make sure that you sort of identify it if you get into the lumbar arteries. Here's a couple of examples. You have good, nice pooling of contrast around the iliac crest. And here's one image of another patient where it's kind of a linear uh, area of pooling. So it's just another example of how this can look. So it, here I think we have a good time to stop with, and for a few questions. So if anybody has anything that they would like to talk about, I'll take questions at this point. All right, well, if no one has any questions, I'm just going to check the chat box. Um, if no one has any questions or you think about something later, you can email me at this address, and I will take your questions by email. So, and feel free to have any uh, questions about interventional radiology or trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Connor. We really appreciate the wonderful lecture. Thank you.